This is the oldest church in town. The congregation held its first meeting in 1743. The current stone building was completed in 1883 after a fire destroyed the majority of its original structure. Mary and Du Bois lived in a cottage located near the horse sheds behind the Congregational Church for about four years. The mother and son were also members of the church. I think that that was very important that Du Bois actually had, I don't want to say a normal childhood, but a childhood different than a lot of African Americans, especially in the South where it's very segregated. Um, I think that him actually being able to um, attend schools with other uh, white children, to socialize in their houses, to go to church with them, kind of showed him what you know um, racial equality looked like. In 1885, four Congregationalist churches in New England pledged $25 each for four years to support Du Bois at Fisk University. Reverend Charles Cornelius Coffin Painter, an ordained Congregational minister in the area, organized the funding. Living in town at the time Du Bois was a teenager, Charles Cornelius Painter was a congregational minister. At, the, at this time he was actually the, a roaming field agent for Fisk University. He traveled around New England recruiting students to attend that school. And he was one of those who quickly identified Du Bois as a, a prime individual to send to Fisk. Now it happened that I had uh, always thought as a boy that I was going to Harvard because it was the largest institution and was in my own state. But uh, I had, as a matter of fact, no money to go there. So that the scholarship was offered me at Fisk and I went to Fisk, but still with the idea that sometime I was going to Harvard. That was a really big deal to send to boys to get a, a college education at Fisk University in Nashville, Tennessee considering that most African Americans didn't even graduate high school at that time. At Fisk, the general surroundings, except the white city, but the general surroundings inside the college were excellent. There was what was to me the new experience of being with my own group of people. When he goes to Fisk University in 1885, it's um, a segregated area, and he basically is able to see how most African Americans actually lived during that period. If I had gone directly from my high school in Great Barrington to Harvard, uh, I would have thought of myself as uh, a Massachusetts uh, man, and my fellows would have been the whites there. But coming from Fisk, I brought with me the feeling of a separate race. I was coming to Harvard for a particular purpose, to break down uh, segregation and separateness. He's able to see that, you know, this isn't, this doesn't have to be the norm. You know, if other places were similar to Great Barrington, um, then maybe the world would be a better place. I know that's kind of idealistic, but you know, for Du Bois, growing up in Great Barrington was really good for him. For him, I would say Great Barrington was a great place um, to live. Of course, not all African Americans had that experience. Um, du Bois was actually the first African American to graduate from Great Barrington High School. Um, a lot of African Americans actually attended, but they would have to drop out because they would have to find a job. Du Bois spent his formative years in Great Barrington. He attended integrated schools, learned about democracy in the town hall, and sharpened his journalistic skills writing editorials about the local black communities in the 1880s. For Du Bois, Great Barrington was a place where democracy and equality existed. His formative years in Great Barrington greatly shaped the man who came to be known as W.E.B. Du Bois.